I feel like right now the last thing I want to hear is the word multiverse. They got rid of all the sexual suggestions, the idea that she's pregnant, that anything has happened here at all. Uh, I put all of that stuff back in. Horror is an effect. It isn't even really a genre. It's like, this is the effect I want to have on a reader. This is the effect I want to have on the viewer. I want to scare the hell out of you. So the one thing I love about fairy tales is you can take them as a template as a writer and you can write just about any kind of story you want. Disney didn't manage to kill the story no matter how hard they tried. So if it can survive the Disney treatment, it can survive anything. It'll change the fiction that you write rather than being a carbon copy of, or an, uh, and a bad carbon copy at that, of, of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. We don't need another Lord of the Rings. We've got one. Hello and welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the geek creators and influencers that built nerd culture. I'm your host, Peter Pischke. What's the connection between our folktale past and our pop cultural present? Today we have a very special guest on the show. He is a performer professor, a writer, and a master of folktales. He is Gregory Frost, a former teacher at Swarthmore College and an author who likes to write about the folktales. He has written Rhymer a fantasy epic based on Scottish folktale and poetry, where an orphan boy discovers he's a gift for rhyme and a connection to an alien group of elves. He's also written Fitcher's Bride, a dark retelling of the French fairy tale Bluebeard, a story from the 16th century, where a young woman uncovers the secrets of her husband's castle. And he has written many other books, stories, and even work in TV in various genres. Today, we're going to talk about folktales, literature from the days gone by and its effect on the present. We will talk about his newest book and even his multiverse story made 30 years before it was even an idea in Kevin Feige's mind. We will also talk about some hot nerd cultural stories going on, like what's up with the terrible Lord of the Rings adaptations lately. Uh, I think this is going to be a fun and fascinating conversation. So please sit back and relax and enjoy our talk today with Professor Gregory Frost. Okay, there we go. That was the fancy <laughs> opening. Uh, okay. Welcome, uh, Gregory. It's great to have Thanks. you. Thank you for coming mm -hmm. on the show. Sure. Uh, my pleasure to be on the show. From everyone I've talked to, you're kind of like the writer's writer. I think this is something <laughs> I've discovered. It's true for okay. like communications, too. It's like they're people that are known for being like for, for general populace or popular. But then there is a, a tier above. And it's like, who are those people that writes for, for the general audience? Who do they look to and revere? And that's kind of where you sit. Because everyone you. I talked to previously, like, oh, yeah, Gregory Frost is super great. He's so smart. He knows about this X and Y. Um, you know, so I'm excited to have you on. You're going to have to send me their names and addresses so <laughs> I can send them a check. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Oh, no, no. I, I think it's well-deserved. I, I have a special place in my heart for anyone that really loves old folk tales, old lore. That kind of stuff just rocks my boat. Boy, I was reading about you and says, oh, and he did an adaptation of Blueberry. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is my guy. So I was excited to come and talk to you today. So uh, I guess we should start here. Tell us about your, your latest book project, which was recently published with Bain Books. Tell us a little bit about Rhymer. Well, okay, Rhymer, is, it, it actually ended up being potentially a three-book series. Uh, that's what Bain asked for. Uh, I pitched them the first book, which is in print right now, um, thinking that's, that's it. That's, I'm just going to do the one book, and you know it'll, I'll be done. And <clears throat> Tony Weisskopf said, I want three. So, you know, pitch me the other two books. So suddenly I'm desperately writing... Uh, outline synopses of, of two other books and uh, and sort of pushing this idea that I'm working with a character, Thomas Reimer, who becomes a sort of eternal champion um, who continues to battle the uh, the elves as we think of them, uh, the Evog as he thinks of them, um, through time, basically. So he's somebody who accidentally becomes somewhat immortal and as a result, um, you know, continues fighting them long after they think he's dead. Um, but anyway, you don't get to that until book two. I'm giving things away. So the first book is based on the, the folk ballad of Thomas the Rhymer. Um, 
but with a, a major twist, which is, well, a couple of major twists, the first of which is Thomas is not taken by the Queen of Elfland, his brother is, and so it becomes a revenge tale. Um, and um, the elves themselves are an alien race. They're not simply peculiar, they're of another world with the sort of overarching intention of changing our world into one that's much more pleasant for them, much more habitable for them. So they want to get rid of us. But they're, you know, they're immortal creatures, so they're in no hurry to get rid of us. They're sort of like a cat playing with a mouse uh, for the longest time they possibly can before they ultimately uh, rearrange the world to their liking. And he's the only one who really knows this is going on to the extent that he knows what's happening. Um, and the only one opposing them. So he becomes sort of, as I say, this sort of champion for the human race. One of the things I really like about this story is that, you, in fact, this reminds me of another book I really like, uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I think there's an adaptation oh, by BBC. Great, great yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, great, great book. I think it's very similar is that you you write from the mindset of that time period. I think when I read a lot of modern books that they say take place in the 19th or the 18th century, they're, they're, it's like the way that people think, the way they approach things is like, no, that's that's not how, you know, that, that that's <laughs> us. That's yeah. just transplanted yeah. one of us back then. But it, when you were, when yeah. Reimer, it seems like this is a guy, no, they, he really does think the way people thought, you know, 200, 300 years ago. How do you how do you get to that mindset? I I uh, listened to something and you said that one of the things to get ready to um, get ready to write this book is you would you study like um, ancient guilds and medieval politics and all all kinds of historical stuff to really put you in that moment. Yeah, a lot of uh, Cambridge University press books arrived at my house over a period of time. So yeah, I I studied everything from the politics of the the time period. What the who the king of Scotland was at that point? What was going on? Uh, because my character also, for a portion of the book, becomes a mercenary. So I needed to know uh, a good deal about medieval mercenaries, the weaponry, um, pretty much you know how people lived. Uh, it turned out by accident. I didn't plan this. That the story takes place at the point where. Uh, the concept of a town and the layout of a town was was just becoming a developed thing. So the notion of towns um, was a new idea at this time. So these people don't think the way we do. They don't, you know, they don't approach the universe the way we do. And I read a lot of stuff about witchcraft uh, beliefs in the period, supernatural beliefs of the supernatural in the period, um, and the philosophy of the period, all of which actually kind of fits together. Um, and then it's just sort of, at least from my perspective, sitting down and trying not to be in the, in the 21st century anymore, um, which is which kind is of a not lot of easy fun. to do. That's that's something no. you really have to train your brain to be able to produce. <clears throat> yeah, I think I, I think I trained myself to do this uh, many years ago. I wrote a. Uh, a retelling of the Irish uh, epic, the Toyne Bo Cualnia, called Toyne, uh, which is the, the tales of Cúhollán, uh, the the champion, the hero of Ulster, who, who stands alone to protect Ulster from pretty much everybody else in Ireland. Um, and as part of the research for that, um, being a much younger person than I am now, um, I bicycled the route of the it's it's about a cattle raid basically and i bicycled the route of the cattle raid across ireland and ended up in armagh and standing on the hill fort that is a major player in the in the locations there so it was really easy to kind of get lost in irish history and irish lore and and as you say the mindset that's not a modern mindset and the more i read about the the celts uh, in particular, the more I realized they were sort of, sort of like the, the Iron Age punks, and I really <laughs> wanted to, you know, kind of like go, go off the edge with this material because it was a lot of fun. It had already been translated brilliantly by Thomas Kinsella, so I didn't really want to do a translation by any means. So, 
there are anachronisms that are intentional all through the book, but at the same time, the characters have a completely different mindset. They're they're basically crazy, um, and they behave in a way that we would probably regard as insane. Uh, you know, if they were running around now. I think that attention detail you have is is just wonderful. This is my one of my current pet peeves, and I've had a I've had a really hard time trying to find a really good um, show or movie that's supposed to be historical and that actually reflects that. The last really great thing I think I watched or, or and or read was uh, Horatio Hornblower, which of course is the the wonderful kind of pulp novel series by C.S. Forster, which he wrote in like the 1920s and 30s, but actually takes place like during the Napoleonic War. He, those books, I, I love the show, especially by the way, uh, the A&D show, which is fantastic. Cannot recommend that to people enough, but he, he writes in such a way that you really feel like you're transplanted back to the Napoleonic Wars. And I, I, I try to read so much of what's done today or I watch, you know, the newest historical biopic on Netflix, and they just always disappoint me because that that attention to detail, that care and understanding, just isn't there. Why do you think people? Is it laziness? Is there just not enough time investment? Maybe this is uh, beyond someone's capabilities. How come we don't see as much of that today in um, in literature and pop culture? Uh, and what what do you think that you are doing that you wish they did? Um, I guess paying attention to detail, but, but it's, it's not even, it's not even just paying attention to detail because a lot of shows I think do pay attention to detail. Uh, if there's a complaint in that area, it would simply be that they're not, they're not writing stories that really inhabit the mindset of somebody who would be alive in that time period. They're telling a story for a modern audience. And so... I think, as you said earlier, they're kind of modernizing it for us. It's like, we're going to tell you this story in 20, 21st century language, but it's really about the, you know, the 14th century or the 15th century or wherever we are. And it doesn't really work somehow. It doesn't really come across. It's sort of like you're saying, you're disappointed because you want to be, you want somebody to actually put you in that time period and let you get lost in it. And, and exactly. to me, that's like, that's the great achievement. And and in a way, books are, are much more likely to do that for you than I think television series or movies in the same sense that you mentioned Lord of the Rings. You know, look at all the different versions of Lord of the Rings made starting with Ralph Bakshi and going through, I don't know, from the 70s on, where people hated the adaptations because it wasn't their notion of what hobbits looked like. Was it their notion of how all, all the characters and the stories behaved, et cetera? So it took a long time for somebody to come up with a version of it that a lot of fans at least could agree on. Uh, although I'm sure there's still people who say, well, that's not just not the way I imagined uh, the Striders. It's not the way I imagined this or that, you know. So, yeah. Um, movie. I, anyway. No, I totally, I totally agree. I think the Peter Jackson movies, I think. They they do a pretty good job. I think they they are fairly authentic to to that feeling. You know, to Tolkien is such a great example of uh, the kind of writer I think we all kind of desire. I think and you're probably one of them. I think I heard you <laughs> say in an interview you said that kind of what inspired you to work on Rhymer is that you felt a connection to Tolkien, who felt that you know everyone had their different kind of elves, and he he felt like there should be some kind of standard. I, I think that is, is fascinating. But, you know, you think about Tolkien, you know, him putting together those books. I mean, he had, he had decades of research. Yes. I mean, his, his studies was in linguistics and maps and stuff, and he, had, he understood, like, the ancient Welsh culture, and he could speak Welsh. I mean, there was all, there was all that background that he could then uh, drag into it. And maybe that's too much to ask of people. It's like, well, before you write this book, I want you to go and study a dead language for two decades. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But it's a good exercise. It's not a bad thing to do, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think he was somebody who who psychologically could move himself back into this fantastical world that he was creating of Middle Earth and, uh, and, and, and just sort of mentally dwell there for extended periods of time. Um, and he knew, God, what, everything about 
the Eddas and and all of the other you know fantastic heroic tales and such uh uh old english middle english uh icelandic all of that stuff he just knew all of those things and that that was actually something that uh, an academic said to me um a while back was that uh in her opinion tolkien had written lord of the rings out of sheer frustration that there wasn't such a thing as a definitive standardized elf every culture or every different story seemed to have a different take on what the elves were and it frustrated him no end that you know everybody's talking about elves but nobody's talking about the same thing so he wanted to write the the definitive codified version of elves and everything else and he pulled it off i mean toba is kind of like the groundwork for most people i think writing in fantasy today i mean what they think of dragons or what they think of orcs or trolls or, or so many of these concepts. I mean, he, he, he like, everything, especially in, like, fantasy games, not just, like, video games of a tabletop, all of that is just, like, someone else's version of Tolkien. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, adult fantasy in the United States, effectively, from a publishing standpoint, started with Tolkien. We probably wouldn't have... Uh, a fantasy genre as we think of it now had it not been for the success of the Lord of the Rings in the 1960s in particular. So that sort of like blew the doors off uh, Ballantine Books who started their adult fantasy series with Lynn Carter as the uh, the editor of the series, uh, a lot of which was reprinting of, of fiction that had been published in the 19th and early 20th century. Some of them, uh, some of those people were contemporaries of and friends of um, J.R. Tolkien as well. So a lot of, I think a lot of what we have is is as a result of the publication of those books as far as fantasy literature goes. But I also think it's, it's important for writers of fantasy, uh, especially writers who are starting out, let's say now, um, not to just stop at Lord of the Rings. Not to just read Lord of the Rings and say, okay, I understand, you know, fantasy and elves and and hobbits and all of this stuff now, and I can go out and I can write the fantasy. It's like, go read what he read. You know, like, take it back at least a couple more steps and look at the things that were influencing him, because it'll change the fiction that you write rather than being a carbon copy of, or an, a, and a bad carbon copy at that, of, of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. We don't need another Lord of the Rings. We've got one. I love Tolkien. Like, like the man, his work is truly incredible. I'm really glad it was brought into the world. But there are some things, like, I wouldn't call necessarily negative, but one of the understandings of classic folk tales and of um, ideas about uh, European mythology is like, and this is what I really liked about Reimer, this this kind of thing always interests me, is that the, the elves in this aren't friendly. And that they're not like particularly nice. And this was a common idea, whether it's like elves or fairies or, you know, even you go to like Ireland, Scotland, changelings, those kind of creatures, they generally weren't friendly and their behavior and outlook was very alien. They're like they're creatures from a whole different universe. And, and the way they, they treat people is usually horrid. And so many, so many books and stories just kind of lean into Tolkien where either they're just kind of like haughty British version of humans or... Or they're just like really nice. They're like all supermodels. Whereas I like in your story, like no, the the, the elves are are kind of buttheads. They're not very nice, uh, and they're really Indeed. they're just odd. They're they're not they're not human. And I appreciate that in your storytelling. Well, thanks. They they can be human. I mean, I think from my perspective, one of the things I I tried to do in the book, and I hope I succeeded, was to keep especially the queen of the Evox, Nick Nevin. Um, she does not have a point of view anywhere in the book. We don't know what she's thinking anytime she's basically on the page. Um, and that was intentional. I don't want to show you what her thoughts are like because I think her thoughts should be impossible for us to comprehend. Um, it should sound, if you heard her thoughts, I think it should sound really, really, really strange. And rather than spend time trying to figure that out, I think, you just don't get to hear them. You're not supposed to know what she thinks. Um, you're sort of, and it sort of puts you in Thomas's point of view and Thomas's perspective on things because he doesn't know what she thinks. He doesn't understand really what's going on here either. 
he's just pissed as hell because they seem to be picking on his family. So, you know, it's it's vengeance that's uh, at least kicking him off in this book. One interesting thing I think that we've lost as a culture is the kind of tales that we like to tell. If you think of modern fiction, modern stories as our version of folk tales, there is an there's a danger. There's a mysterious, but it's it's a dangerous kind of mysterious to these older stories. Bluebeard, which you you Fitcher's Bride, and anyone that wants to do a story remaking Bluebeard has got a special place in my heart. I just I adore I just adore that kind of stuff, like Grimm's fairy tales, really old French folk tales. That's that's I'm totally into it. And Bluebeard, for those who, uh, maybe I should ask you just to explain to readers like a quick summary of Bluebeard. But Bluebeard is one of these folk tales where the moral of the story isn't exactly necessarily a good one. And what happened, you know, what the tension in the story is just horrible. Why do you think it is the stories of the past had that tension where where there was this greater sense of danger or like one wrong step in the woods and you get eaten by the wolf versus like <laughs> what, what we have now? And that is kind of a bigger question so you can piece that out if that's easier for you i'll see, <laughs> i'll see if i can deal with that not. well so bluebeard to go back to what you uh something you said a little earlier is a story about or just to explain bluebeard the basic premise of bluebeard is he's a very wealthy um character nobody really knows his his past where he comes from anything um in the version of Bluebeard that I took as the template for Fitcher's Brides, uh, it's a story called Fitcher's Bird. So I'm actually having fun with the title of the fairy tale that is based on itself. Um, <clears throat> the character shows up and he marries, there are three sisters, and he marries the oldest sister. She comes to stay with him and he has this huge Asshole, this huge estate, and um, and strange people are there, but they're always sort of in the distance, and she doesn't know who they are, or what they are, what exactly is going on with her new husband and her new life. And they just get settled in the house, and he says, well, I have to go away on business, and I'm going to leave you with the keys to the house. So here are the keys to all the rooms in the house. You can go any place at all except this one room. You can't use this one key. And of course, it doesn't look like any of the other keys. And he says, and I'll be back in a few weeks. Bye. You know, and he leaves. And of course, if that's the last thing you tell somebody before you leave, and they're looking at that key, you're going to go find that room. <laughs> I mean, True. it's just setting them up to do it, right? And so, of course, she goes through all the other rooms, and finally she's left with that one key and that one door. It drives you crazy. So she opens the door and discovers that it's basically an abattoir. He and she's not his first wife. She's something like the fourth or fifth wife. And the bodies of all his previous wives are in this room and they're all cut up into pieces. And she dro screams and drops the key and there's blood all over the floor, of course, so it gets on the key. She can't get the blood out of the key. She can't get it to... She's scrubbing the key. She's doing everything she can to clean the case. She can't get the blood out. And he magically shows up like right after this. Instead of being gone for however long he said he was going to be gone, he just turns up because somehow he knows that she's done this. And he says, well, so I hand over the keys and she gives him the key and he sees the blood on the key and he knows that she's gone into the room she wasn't supposed to go in. And he goes, well, too bad for you and drags her down the hall and she's, you know, the next victim. And he goes back to the family and he marries the middle sister and goes through the same routine. And finally, of course, she fails the test too. And finally, marries the youngest daughter. And the youngest daughter is the smart daughter, the one who knows what's going on somehow and gets around everything that he tries to set up to, uh, to test her, to trick her, to prove that She's, you know, violated the rules that he's established. Um, and she eventually bumps him off. Um, the original version of Bluebeard, which was called Bluebeard, which was the 16th or 17th century French uh, version, is just Bluebeard's 
got one wife and she finds out everything that that we just described here where she finds out that he's been married many times before and the bodies of all the other wives are dead in the house. But that version of Bluebeard, the woman has three brothers and another sister and they go and with well, she has to stay in the castle. Her sister goes and calls the brothers and the brothers come to rescue her and they break down the door and Bluebeard has returned and um, and is, I think, upstairs, as I recall, sharpening his axe. And he's kind of going, as soon as I get the axe sharpened, I'm going to come downstairs and, you know, cut your head off. And um, seems to take a really long time to sharpen his axe. though. And the brothers arrive and they break the door down and they come in and they prevent him from killing their sister and they kill him and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because fairy tales are always just grisly uh, sorts of things when they when things happen in them. Um, so anyway, I was working with those um, and other versions of Bluebeard. Uh, there are do I, dozens of them. There, there are Bluebeards where the Bluebeard is, a, I think, a rabbit in one story. Um, you know, there are all different kinds of Bluebeard stories that are collected, um, that were collected by the Brothers Grimm, just, just by the Grimms alone. Um, so anyway, I took the basic template of that and dropped it on uh, New York in the 1840s in the Finger Lakes District, which for America was sort of the, what do I want to say, the religious experimental center of the country at that time, where just one religion after another popped up. Some of them survived and most of them sort of failed and then everybody would run off and join another religion. It got to the point where it was referred to as the burned over district because it's sort of like this fire of passion would roar through New York. Everybody would be very excited. The religion would die. They'd go and start or join the next religion. The same thing would happen. You'd have this sort of frenetic uh, experiment in, in, uh, in religion. Um, and that would die and they'd jump in and start another one. So as I say, I got to got to be called the uh, the burned over district after a while. Um, so anyway, I, I only had to go back to 1848 for uh, for that one. It wasn't such a, a leap. So thank you for explaining the, the story of Bluebeard, because I think probably lots of people have, have heard it, but they, they probably didn't realize like that's the name. But it's a it's a very common archetype story. A lot of uh, famous ghost stories are based on it, or even modern horror stories are some version of it. And and the old moral to it, it, it's interesting because even the version that we know, which is the earliest, I think it's like, like you said, the 17th century France, so 1600s. And even that version is probably just the latest thereof. It's probably actually a much older story, you know, just got passed on um, verbally over the generations and the big moral of that story is like it's uh the danger of curiosity it's not exactly yes. what we might think it is because you'd say well obviously she's totally in the right but the, the, our wonderful ancestors in france you know at the time of this louis the sun king was like no actually curiosity is really bad she should have she should have rocked <laughs> the boat yes i think charles perrault who wrote that version of the story he ends it with a moral saying Ladies, you should always pay attention to what your husbands say because look what happens when you don't. It's like, okay, that's not the moral I would have taken away from that story, but yeah, sure, go with that, Charles. You know, yeah, yeah. It's just so like, is it a mindset thing? Why is it that the modern stories we have today, in many ways, they feel much safer? They don't have this like really dark edge, like one wrong step and things could go horribly wrong. You know, whether you're looking at old stories like Red Riding Hood, that's another one, or many of the classic grim uh, folk tales, there was there's this sense of dangerous mystery. And I feel like today our our stories, I mean, you do get people who do write like suspenseful fiction or or mysteries of the sort, but in general, our our kind of folk tales that we have does not have that. Why do you think that it is that because like we live in a modern period, so we feel much more secure? Is there something we don't understand they did? I'm curious to hear it because you've adapted a number of folk tales over the years, so you might have some thoughts on this. Well, in fact, the first time I adapted a folk tale was for an anthology that um, Ellen Dallow and Terry Windling were doing, called Snow White, Blood Red, 
and uh, they let me do uh, Rapunzel. And in <clears throat> in researching Rapunzel, I found out that the uh, Brothers Grimm had bowdlerized that f fairy tale um, by the second edition of their collection of fairy tales. So it's only printed once with the original dynamics of the story attached to it. So even the Brothers Grimm were bowdlerizing the stories because they wanted to protect the reader, especially children, from hearing something dark and grisly. Whereas, you know, if you ask children, they go, no, I want to hear the, the really horrible, icky stuff. You know, they want the worst story imaginable. Um, but the drive was to not have children hear these stories. Um, and in the case of Rapunzel, what they took out of the story after the first edition of it was, um, well, basically Rapunzel is taken away. She's, how do I want to say this, the short form? Rapunzel is a, a baby who uh, is delivered to a woman who is obsessed with eating um, a kind of lettuce called Rapunzel, hence the name. Uh, and the Rapunzel grows in the garden next to their house. And so the woman sends her husband over the, the wall into the garden of the neighbor's house. And the neighbor is a witch um, who catches him doing this and says, okay, I'll let you go on the condition that when your child is born, you give her to me. And he's, you know, going, yes, absolutely. I'll give her to you because I don't want to die. Um, and so when the child is born, the witch comes and says she's mine and takes her away, calls her Rapunzel, puts her up in a tower um, where she will never see any men because the woman has uh, some kind of issue with the male of the species. She doesn't want this girl to know anything about the opposite sex, even that they exist. Um, and eventually Rapunzel... And, and the old woman, whose name is Mother Gothel, goes away every single day, and Rapunzel meets uh, a young prince, or sees a young prince, and we know the story. She throws her hair down the, out of the castle window, and he climbs up her hair and discovers that she's in the tower, um, and they start having uh, a relationship. Well, in the original version of Rapunzel, by inference, it's very clear that they've had a sexual relationship because the thing that trips her up is she's sitting one day with Mother Gothel and the prince that she's met has left. And she says to Mother Gothel, Mother Gothel, I don't understand. My clothes aren't fitting properly anymore. They're too tight. She's pregnant. You know, she oh doesn't gosh. know. She doesn't know what pregnant is. She doesn't know it's possible because Mother Gothel has kept all sexual information away from her so she knows nothing um so of course she's punished she's banished and he's has his eyes put out etc it's again grisly fun for um for everybody in the second edition forward instead of that rapunzel is sitting there with mother gothel and uh she just out of the blue says mother gothel you're a lot heavier to pull up than the prince is and you're like, well, that was a stupid thing to say. You just admitted that you're, you know, you've had this relationship with this prince that she knew nothing about. So they got rid of all the sexual suggestions, the idea that she's pregnant, that anything has happened here at all. It's completely, effectively whitewashed. And they've also made her an idiot because she would say something like that to give away the fact that she's, you know, met somebody. Um, so... Uh, I put all of that stuff back in because it was much more interesting, I think, the first edition of it and the idea that, you know, not telling somebody uh, what happens if you have sex, what the outcome is going to be is uh, is relevant to our time. That, you know, you should you should be teaching people what what happens, what the consequences of, of sexuality are. It's fascinating because it, our Disney versions today, and I mean, this is like a really low level kind of comment, but it's like they are, people say they are so sanitized, and that is true. But what they're also sanitized isn't just like um, 
the le- what we consider a less child approach, but they're also sanitized from like a lot of the moral lessons these older stories were trying to convey. They are warnings. Yeah, in, in fact, the one thing I love about fairy tales is you can take them as a template as a writer, and you can write just about any kind of story you want just using the structure of the fairy tales because they've been effectively time-tested. But more importantly, to some extent, Disney didn't manage to kill the story no matter how hard they tried. So if it can survive the Disney treatment, it can survive anything. It's it's like those are great templates for for fantasy stories, that uh, especially the fairy tales that people don't know that much uh, become really interesting as structures that you can build a story on. Yeah, I believe at one point when Katzenberg was still working with Disney, so he he later created um, DreamWorks, but when he was with Disney, he created what was referred to as the Golden Age. That's like Lion King, Aladdin, Little Mermaid, Mulan, you know, the, the, the bigger films people are familiar with. I think they did try adapting Bluebeard at some point, which I'm really curious to, like, well, how would that even work? Well, again, it would be a it would be a grisly cartoon uh, if if that's what you're doing. Um, yeah, there's some parts you just can't really like like replace with. It's like uh, I don't know, the the part with the bodies is pretty integral. Yeah, I think I I I don't know that I'd want to see what Disney would do with with Bluebeard. I mean, they they sort of destroyed the Little Mermaid too. I mean, Hans Christian Andersen was a little nuts, but. Uh, you know, all of the 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 price that's paid for her wanting to become a human um, just doesn't exist anywhere in the movie, in the cartoon, in the musical, in any version of it that they're doing. Uh, it doesn't really feel like it's it's true. It's not true to the original story, but the original story itself is kind of kind of odd. You know, it 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 is. It's funny. Uh, my my grandparents especially my my grandma and mother's side her family's all danish they came from this little iowa town um uh, i'm trying to think of the name anyhow there's they were super into uh hans christian anderson so there's a statue dedicated to him and they they did all these things that that's like that's their guy it's so funny because if you get to know them like the way he wrote the the moral of those stories it is very similar like it's a very kind of Danish Christian way of thinking because it's like this this even in the little original Little Mermaid story it ends with like but she, you know even though she really screwed up she has a chance to repent and maybe become an angel or, yes, or a exactly. cloud yes she's <laughs> taken up into the sky and you're going yeah okay it doesn't really you know and all because she wanted to meet a human guy you know so she wanted feet so this is well, this is how he repaid cost. her. Yeah, high cost for what you want. Yeah, yeah. It's funny all those weird little ec- uh, eccentricities. It's, it's kind of partly like, what makes it, the story so interesting, though. It's yeah, like, yeah, there is that. There's that note of oddness, that weirdness, that kind of like, oh, this is this is different. This is not just like everything else. That kind of like is where I was going with with my much too long question about folk tales. It's like, what happened between now? And back then, because even in the Victorian period, you read like Victorian ghost stories. There's so many great Victorian um, ghost stories. Ghost stories between like 1870, 1920, which is fantastic. Hundreds of them. Yeah. What what changed? Because we don't we don't have the we don't have as many of those fun odd eccentricities. We don't have so many of these stories like these huge warnings. Our our kind of folk tales, our fairy tales, they almost always have happy endings. The good people win out. The bad people don't. There's not large consequences for actions in the same way. Like, like what happens? Is that just because of modernity? Is that because, like, uh, our safety or medicine? How are we different from our ancestors? <laughs> um, I don't know. If we're looking for happy endings, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about that because I tend to default to unhappy endings. In fact, Reimer has a happy ending, but mainly it has a happy ending because Tony Weisskopf said, you have to have the happy ending. So I went, okay, so I'll do that. No problem. Oh, that is, well, I, but that is interesting because Bain does have plenty of books that are, are more serious. But yeah, Tony, Tony Weisskopf, I'd love to talk to, to her one day. She's, she's a fascinating character. But she has a really great sense of how to, how to really put together a great story, how to sell a book. So it is interesting that she, she said, actually, no, we're not going with the pessimistic ending. Yeah, we're not going to do that. But... But I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it may be in part that people are trying different things, but it's also, 
it also may be because the ghost story, especially since you mentioned that form in particular, was considered sort of high art in the in the Victorian period in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, you had writers like Elizabeth Bowen writing uh, ghost stories. You had you know Henry James writing ghost stories. You had all kinds of people writing ghost stories. So that was there was no distinction made. And then it sort of you know. In the 1970s, I sh and you can't blame Stephen King for this. He was just writing what he was writing. But mm -hmm. you, you suddenly had a genre of horror fiction sort of explode on the landscape. And I don't know if that was helpful or or not, but it feels in, like in some way it sort of segregated the horror story from the rest of literature. And we didn't want that anymore. So... No, that's a good point. I had not thought of that. That's a good point. Uh, every every Halloween, so every uh, month of October, I read uh, ghost stories. Uh, M.R. James, huge, huge fan of M.R. Oh, James. Yeah. It's not really a bad M.R. James story. I love other people like um, E.F. Benson. I love. Yep. I just love yep. those kind of stories. But you, you are right. It was like ghost stories, what we consider the scary genre, what were the stories that make us feel that way. They weren't separate out the way they are today yeah it was just all fiction yeah yeah i almost i almost wish that it, w it was more like that you know when you like at a movie you didn't feel like oh well all the movies that make you feel scared go over here they're all in horror <laughs> <laughs> well it's like that's kind of boring which is ridiculous too because horror i mean t t at least in my opinion horror is an effect it isn't even really a genre it's like this is the effect I want to have on a reader. This is the effect I want to have on the viewer. I want to scare the hell out of you. So this is what I'm going to do in the story. Uh, but you can do that in a story that's otherwise ridiculously comical or uh, or seems to be a nice, light, pleasant story. And then something changes. And just on that basis of that one moment, it becomes much darker. And you realize everything that you thought was nice and light and friendly is anything but so I think there's a lot of room for using horror as an as an effect in any kind of fiction true I was trying to think of the name of the story and the author because I don't I don't think it's M.R. James it's very M.R. James like but I was thinking there's this uh, famous story and this, it, it's really interesting because it's basically a story of these two guys they're traveling down the Danube and on this trip, they come to a, they need to stop for the night. They come into a marshy reed area, so it's still on the dam, but slightly elevated, so it's dry enough they can pitch their tent. And there's never like any stated. There's not really like a stated ghost or a creature, but it's just the sense of like things are off. And it's just brilliant in the way that it tells that story. I mean, I, I always kind of feel like how you could creatively influence your readers to feel something without having to lean in so heavily or be so, uh, I, I mean, ironic with this literature, but literal. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I wish we kind of got more of that, but maybe that's that's just me. I mean, my tastes are probably a little bit removed from the general public, but that, that, that that's just my personal complaint. I just, I love all that kind of stuff. Why I was excited to have you on, by the way, because it's like, I don't meet a lot of people I can talk about. You want to talk about, you know, folk tales from Germany in the 1700s? Absolutely. I, I, I don't think so. I'll pass. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of things are you into today? Do you do you watch a lot of movies or TV? Do you have a favorite um, show or series that you're following? Um, not at the moment. I'm trying to think the last... I think the last series that I followed sort of religiously was The Expanse which I thought was absolutely magnificent science fiction. Just really brilliant space opera. Um, yeah, that that is an excellent show. I like the books, too. I wish the show had kept I did going. Too. I Because I, I feel like the audience was there, but maybe the production costs were too high. But then they look at the Rings of Power, and they have, that's the most expensive television show. I mean, they think there's one more that's like competitive for it. It's a, it's a Chinese um, historical dramatic series. I can't think of its name right now. Um, but it's up there. It's like neck and neck for most expensive television show, you know, dollars per episode ever done. And universally, people hate it. Which is so confusing because it's like people like The Expanse. It, it was expensive, wasn't as expensive. So I don't, I don't totally understand that. 
Speaking of adaptations people hate, <laughs> and since you are someone that appreciates um, great fiction, Rings of Power, and there was also recently another game, Gollum. These are adaptations of yeah. Lord of the Rings. They're right. terrible. They're terrible. They're dreadful. It's not just like, it's not just because like there's a lack of quality, like people aren't thinking this through and they're just kind of, the writing's lazy and that is true. But it's also, they don't really seem to understand what made those those stories interesting to people or applicable right. or what they were tapping into. What do you think modern writers are getting wrong here or, or modern entertainment? Like, because you seem to have a good, you have a good, you have a sense of the pulse of where writing and stories used to be. So maybe you can give us insight to what's happening right now. Why do we feel so less fulfilled? Why, why does so much of this content suck? Um, I think I have to say in some respects, content has always sucked. Um, in, in terms of films, I mean, and, and I grew up watching Friday Night Creature Features and that sort of thing where the budget was 50 cents, you know, and they made the, you know, the, a giant a giant grasshopper or a giant tarantula that's clearly, you know, a little spider and a little grasshopper, you know, and, and they're filming it in such a way that they seem enormous or night of the Lem I mean, it's night of the, no, night of the lepus. I think a night of the lepus with the giant bunny rabbits, if that's right. It's hard oh, for what? me to remember. So, you know, there are some, there are terrible movies and there have always been really terrible movies. Uh, and, and, and I'm fond of a lot of those movies, but now it's sort of like, I don't know. It's, it's one thing if you're making a terrible film on a really low budget and you know it and you sort of lean into that versus you make a terrible film with a lot of money which means it wasn't supposed to be a terrible film. And you you didn't try to lean into that, but you kind of did. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think there have always been really good stories told, really good films, and there have always been sort of not so good. I don't know if it's just selective memory or, or, or what, um, or if stuff is really worse now. There's more content now than there used to be, too, so it's probably harder for stuff to be all of a, a decent quality because there's so much of it. And here's the, here's the yeah, I, this movie sounds fantastic. Cole Hillman's Arizona Ranch is plagued with mongrel rabbits. He wants to employ ecologically sound control method as a favor to college benefactor Hillman. College president Eldon Clark calls in zoologist Roy Bent to help. Bennett immediately begins injecting rabbits with hormones, genetically mutated blood, in an effort to develop a method of disrupting rabbit reproduction. One of the test subjects escaped, resulting in a race of bloodthirsty, wolf-sized <laughs> man, horse, and cow eating bunnies. That's fantastic. Yep. I don't know why yep. I've never heard that movie before. And it, it lives up to that, I'll tell you, right now. Uh, yeah. What a solution. What a sol <laughs> that, that's, that's, you're overthinking this. Like, put some poison traps out or something. Come on. Yeah, giant killer rabbits. Yeah, it's uh, it's special. One of the big differences, I think, though, is you were right. There's, so there's always been stupid, pulpy fiction that's always existed. I Even during, like, the Victorian ghost, um, ghost story, there was, of course, Penny and Dreadfuls. There's always been that kind of stuff. There's always something that's cheaper, more body. Um and that does appeal to a lot of people, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think the difference is some of this is what we consider high art to the masses. What do we consider the stuff that we want to emulate and elevate, like what you might see on Netflix or on Amazon or in theaters? I think often those stories, they just do not have the same kind of authorship, and they, they just don't seem to have that same attention to detail, as you said. Like, sometimes it just goes back to just doing your homework. You like I look at any of the history based shows they have on Netflix, or I look at like this is a continuation of a Jane Austen story. It's like nothing in this is remotely what Jane Austen would have written. Like not even not even close. And it, it, it's it's frustrating or disappointing to me. I mean, I I don't just want to throw this in politics because I think that's kind of the stupid answer. Sometimes people just want to make everything about politics, but it does seem like. What we are doing, what we put our attention to, the big, the big items, you know, the top thing on the billboard, they do seem dumber than they used to be. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean that's all subjective, but I have to agree with you. It does seem like it's dumber than it used to be, but um, 
I don't want to go back through all of the examples to make sure that's true. I think that's that's a job for somebody else. Um, so one of the books that actually before um, I was talking to Sean Corey Scar who recommended that we bring you on the show. Sean is wonderful. Sure, um, it's terrific. Yeah, and he had yeah. I looked through your stuff, and you had read Lyric, which actually is a book I read. I was surprised. It was surprised because I like, actually I do remember this book because my grandpa has a copy of it in his library, and that that is the book that it was kind of like dimension hopping, sort of with like these alien this alien duo. Um, yeah, yeah. You this is like a book from like 1980. This is like 30 some almost four years before Disney decides multiverse. That's what we're going to do with our our Marvel comic book movie series. We're going to make everything about the multiverse. You you were you were in on it. <laughs> I wish I had coined the term too, um, but yeah, but yeah, that's exactly what they are. It's two two characters who are pursuing a um, a fiend from their world, but they're passing through all of these multiverses, and in every world they stop in, they take on a physical form, and they finally arrive in in this world that um, is supposed to be like two steps away from our universe. So there, it's like a near Earth, but it, but they're one or two layers away from us. What did you learn from that project? I, oh, we talked about this recently with um, David Weber and also Justin Watson. Um, multiverse and time travel, those kind of things are very hot in stories right now. Um, one comment they met is it's a bit of a dead end for, for a lot of writers because it, it kind of blows up what your story can do and it kind of makes the stakes feel unreal. What did you learn from that project you think maybe people should be applying to these stories now? Because I feel like even though it was a multiversal story, there was some grounded like in your leads. I didn't, I did maybe because it was just basically, you know, a smaller story that isn't such a big deal. But I kind of worry sometimes like even with these new Marvel movies, I don't know if you watch the MCU at all, but it feels yes. like Yes, it everything. It feels like, oh, much. well, maybe Spider-Man dies, but there's like an infinite number of him. We can always just get another. Yeah. Yeah. Or or we've got the Ben Affleck Batman and we've got, you know, other Batmans. We can bring all the people who play Batman back and do the same, you know, do the same thing. Exactly. Michael exactly. Keaton Batman versus, <laughs> I don't even want to go there. It's just, a, it becomes insane after a while. Um. <clears throat> So I I mean I I I feel like right now the last thing I want to hear is the word multiverse because I think it's been sort of like ground into paste by all of these you know by the Doctor Strange multiverse by the Spider Man multiverse by the DC Comics doing their version of the multiverse you know with the Flash now et cetera et cetera everybody's doing the multiverse it's sort of like it's like clones were once upon a time where every Every freaking story and movie that came out for a while was about clones. And now it's probably going to be artificial intelligence movies and stuff because that's the thing everybody's going to be writing about now. It's everything will be artificial intelligence does X. Now, we've already sort of seen that to death, so I don't know what new and fresh and exciting material anybody's going to come up with, if there is any. But... But the multiverse should probably be put down and left alone for a while and just let it cool off before you come back to it. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't know either. I understand why it's a, like it's obvious why companies love it because it gives them an excuse to use uh, legacy properties and you know they can just slab all whatever they got in the right. back room. Like you saw this in the, spa the newest Space Jam movie, which was like, here's all the IPs that Warner Brothers own. Like all yeah. of them, <laughs> all of them. Put them yes. on there, yeah, yeah. Um, it it feels like so artistically with almost without merit, though. It's like, oh, <laughs> what do you see? Like Bugs Bunny sitting next to like the guy from Clockwork Orange next to <laughs> Alex. And right. you're like, what is yeah. happening here? Like, is this like, a, is this a fever dream? What is going on? Yeah, that's definitely uh, putting the putting the various genres uh, and characters into a blender and hitting puree, you know, it's like, God knows what they, what they wanted you to take away from that experience. I do not know. Oh, uh, it's, it's but crazy. But that's sort of, yeah, it's like you're saying, you can almost, it, it becomes an excuse to do almost anything, even if it makes no sense whatsoever. You can do it, so do it, you know. 
which but is it really it takes away from like the because it's like well now you just evaluate all those things just a little bit good job yeah exactly if you had a chance to have any of your work um made with an adam adaptation i think from what i i don't of course don't know all of your bio work but from what i do know right. i think you have some stories that would work pretty well um which, what are those stories would you like it to be and who would you like to do who would you have like to do it would you like like we talked about the peter jackson's would you like peter jackson to adapt rhymer would you like i i don't know <laughs> like james cameron to adapt lyric what would what would be your choice i'm not sure i would pull somebody like that but i'd love to see somebody when the second volume of rhymer comes out um which is set a hundred years in the future of, of this one essentially um the structure of the three book series and the structure of the proposed series as a series will finally become clear because the first book doesn't really tell you anything like that. It's an origin story. Um, I would love to see somebody do like a 10 part Netflix or Apple TV or whatever series of each uh, 10 part season or a part season or what have you of each of the books because each of the books it would be set in a different time. So you've got a effectively a whole different world in every single book, uh, sort of moving steadily through history up to the, the present day. Um, that's the proposed series anyway. But sure, I'd love to see somebody do that. Um, I'd like, there's a story that was just out in uh, Asimov's magazine in May that I wrote collaboratively with a writer named Bill Johnson, a story called Boomerang, that I would love to see somebody like Love, Death, and Robots do as a, like a five or 10 minute animation piece, because I think the work they do there is brilliant. Um, that so, would be good. Or like uh, like how Black Mirror used to be. So yeah, 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 yeah I get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, adapt the uh, sh uh, the. Uh, Science fiction short stories, of course, wonderful, and take like one of those and do like uh, a TV presentation of that. That's kind of like what Twilight Zone was started as back in the day. It was like, oh, here's a here's a story that's you know someone someone already had written, and uh, let's do that. I think all that works out great. I I love that kind of thing. I don't have any more any real thing to say other than I like short story fiction. So <laughs> it's not it wasn't the most constructive uh, comment. Well, let me throw this out then. Since we've been talking about horror and ghost stories and stuff, uh, I have an, antho or an anthology, I have a collection that will be coming out um, probably early next year called uh, Beyond Here Be Monsters. And that's all of my horror-related fiction, all the dark stuff, all the mo all the monstrous fiction. Um, so maybe that'll be, you know, reason for me to come back and talk with you some more about uh Things horrific and things dark and um, and more Mr. James. I don't know. Yeah, excellent. Well, you can never go wrong with more Mr. James. I agree. Yeah. Oh, but, okay. So one last thing, I think before we'll, we'll finish it up, I mentioned it a little bit in the intro, but you actually did some um, TV writing in the '90s for a documentaries that would later end up on Discovery Channel. That that's a fascinating period because I remember when Discovery Channel, History Channel. This makes me sound so old, but even like like the mid two thousands, it was still kind of this way, where they had actual history, you know, like yeah, history, <laughs> documentaries, science. You know, there was yeah. a point. I remember it's so funny because I remember this the late two thousands. I was like, yeah, these things are never coming back. D the Discovery Channel had a special, and they aired it in at the same time with like Good Morning America. And here was here was the what it was: watch a man be swallowed by a python. That was it. It was like, we're going to watch in real time. This man will be swallowed by Python. I think he got like halfway swallowed and the man like, like got scared and gave up by the way, much farther along than I, but I, yeah, I don't, taken I that don't think like, I would no. have volunteered for this show. Yeah, no. Uh -uh. Yeah. But when I, when I saw it, I was like, yeah, the, the, the history shell, the skirt shell, those things are never come back. We've crossed, we've crossed the Python Rubicon. Uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit what was it like doing tv writing and stuff like that did, did you like getting a taste of that was that kind of a, a fun area for you to work in for a time yeah i really enjoyed doing it uh i was a principal researcher for a production company called grinning dog pictures and they did two episodes of a series called science frontiers that was i think on the discovery channel and 
they tried to take a, a very scientific or reasonable approach to weird subjects. So the very first episode that I was the researcher for was about werewolves. Like where do they? Where does the the lore, the folklore, the mythology of werewolves come from? So I did all the research for that show. Um, found out a lot of really, really amazing and interesting things uh, about werewolves, uh, including that the the earliest mention of a werewolf that we found was of a boxer in ancient Greece who was an Olympic boxer who was a werewolf. So go figure. Um, and the second series we did was about the curse of the pharaohs, the idea that there was some curse on the tombs and, you know, in the... In, in and around the Nile Valley, um, including Tudog Common's tomb, because there was supposed to be a curse on that tomb, and various and sundry people died, and so on and so forth. So we did a a fairly exhaustive study of, of all the cases and figured out from a medical point of view, as it turned out, what what it appeared was the real curse of the pharaohs, which is a, a fungus. So it was it was oh, fascinating. That is interesting. That does sound like a fun job. I might enjoy doing something like that. Yeah, going oh, somehow it all goes back to folk tales with the Lugaru. That's the, the <laughs> French <laughs> werewolf. Which is interesting <laughs> enough, the French idea of the werewolf was basically just a big wolf. <laughs> it's just like them wolves are scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was <wants> wolf. <laughs> it's funny you say Lugaru though, because I think that was my introduction to the werewolf was that that term. On a Johnny Quest episode when I was probably about twelve years old, and I thought, "Oh, that's really interesting. I've never heard of that before." So I went and researched that. So for no particular reason, but uh, there was uh, one time a uh, French person was was coming through and they stayed in my ward, and uh, the story was about there was someone they were talking about reintroducing the wolves to Minnesota. They they're in, in right. Black Hills. They have yeah. done it. They have already started to do it in Minnesota. But did this person was like, why would you do that? Like the the French opinion of the wolves, like no, wolves are bad. Don't do that. You know, <laughs> no, no, no wolves. No I was, wolves. I've always remembered that. I've always like, okay, so our cultural understanding of wolves different. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got the best literature too. So there, no way. Now yeah, so yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Gregory, thank you so much for coming on. I had a lot of fun. Uh, My pleasure. I like your books. I hope uh, I wish you success with Rhymer and its uh, follow-ups, and I will have to have you on again sometime. Uh, where can people find your stuff? They like what they heard today, or they want to learn more about you. Where could they go online? Uh, if they want to go online, I've got a short story collection in ebook format only at this point uh, that was originally published by Golden Griffin. Uh, that's available from Bookview Cafe uh, online. You could look that up. Um, the rest of my books are available from independent bookstores, regular bookstores, you know, Barnes and Noble. What what's the competition for Barnes and Noble anymore? I don't know if there is any. I don't um, know if they exist. I I yeah, think they're and so go to your favorite independent bookstore and um uh, and, and hunt them up. They're they're online. They're on Amazon. Everything's on Amazon. So, you know. True, true. Of course you you have a uh, stuff with Bain Books and I think you do have a website of your own as well. I do. And that's just GregoryFrost.com. So easy to check out. And you can sign up for a newsletter if you want to do that. So cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Gregory. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you again to all our audience, our listeners, and our viewers. It is much appreciated. Uh, this show is sponsored in part with the help of the wonderful people at Bain Books Publishing, an imprint of Simon and Schuster, and also with the help of Young Voices, a journalism organization. This show, of course, would not be possible without the wonderful help of my incredible editor, Chris Holowicki, who makes me look much smarter and more competent than I actually am. And until <laughs> next time, all my friends and listeners, keep geeking out. Oh,